The piece we're going to talk about today, I sometimes call everybody's favorite piece because, well, I've heard so many people say, oh, that's my favorite piece. I love it so much. So we're going to look at what is it about this piece that makes it so special to so many people and so loved? And what is it about its expressiveness that communicates so directly? We're also going to talk about how we can look at the structure of the piece, its various elements, and play it in a way that maybe even is more beautiful and more communicative by noticing some things that are often overlooked. So I hope that the little talk will elucidate some aspects of this piece, both for students and for teachers. So let's jump right in and start talking about how this piece begins and what are its elements. As you know, the piece starts with this very simple and lovely melody. So that's the first four bar phrase. And as we go along, you'll notice that the whole piece consists of four and eight bar phrases, more regular than almost any piece of Mozart or Haydn or any piece of the classical era. And it's one of the reasons that Brahms is often called the most classical of the Romantic composers. Not only did he feel himself in the tradition of Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert, but his phrase structure is often extremely regular, even more than the classicists. So the basic kernel idea of this piece is this three note idea. And it could easily be, have been answered by going up, going down. But instead, he turns what could have been into, by going up to that high A, that's the first really significant, expressive, compositional stroke of genius, in my opinion. That rising seventh is so full of poignancy in a way that the same pitch an octave lower simply wouldn't be. So that's the first thing I think to be aware of. Now, as performers, how do we make that rising seventh beautiful and poignant? Do we put a flashlight on it or a spotlight and... and make it the goal of those first two measures? I think not. I think that reaching, reaching up that seventh should be something that we experience as difficult, as reaching for an interval which is dissonant which contains within it some pain, even though the harmony underneath is consonant. So those two measures are then answered. Before going any further, I want to talk a little bit about the accompanying voice, the left hand, because there's a common mistake that's made in playing this piece, and that's to ignore the little two-note phrases in the eighth note voice, which is divided between the right and the left hand. You see, they, they're notated with two note phrases, which gives them a kind of pulsation and kind of undulation, much like uh, the accompaniment of a, this Haydn variation. Brahms's version. So one thing you definitely don't want to do is, is to link those three bass notes as a group, especially after, because that immediately shifts too much attention to the left hand and breaks that pulsation which Brahms so carefully notated. Mm -hmm. 
So what we have is not only this pulsation, but a very typical way of building four-bar phrases that's taken from the classical period of short, short, long. So we have one bar, second bar, and then two bars together. One could almost imagine, with a different accompaniment, this being a classical minuet. Very elegant, very poised. But in Brahms's version, of course, it's lyrical, it's cantabile, and it has a warmth that a classical minuet wouldn't have. But in its phrase structure, and in its pulsation, there is something very regular and something which could evoke almost a minuet. Uh, one other thing from the performance standpoint that I would like to suggest one be aware of at the very beginning is to be cantabile in the first eight bars because the second eight bars are pianissimo and very often one hears very little difference between the first eight bars, which are piano, and the second eight bars, which are pianissimo. So really have a warm, full... And then listen to this harmony. So that's a harmony one could savor by just a slight bit of hesitation as one reaches it. And notice the second time that wonderful melodic seventh occurs, it's with a different harmony. So that should be also noticed. The first time it's to D major, second time. So that's all even more delectable the second time and more touching when the D sharp is introduced. A little time at the end of the phrase, then pianissimo. Now, the second eight bars, which are pianissimo, it's interesting that in the third measure of that phrase, Brahms does something which is much more harmonically intense than anything that happened in the piano phrase, the stronger phrase at the beginning. Listen to this. So he actually adds something of expressive interest and expressive intensity in the quiet phrase. So the pianissimo phrase, as compared to the piano phrase, should not be just thought of as a pale shadow of the first phrase. Oh, now we do the first phrase again, but softer. No, it's actually going deeper into the emotional realm of the music uh, by becoming even more intimate, more personal. So this... So the second beat has in two voices an appoggiatura and a resolution. Be very careful to pedal only the second eighth of that measure. You will not want to hear this. But because one goes through it, very often that's the case. Just pedaling routinely by the beat. No, I... 